Welcome to today's webinar. Thanks for joining us for a great discussion on how your facility can, re can create resiliency, reliability, redundancy, and earn incentives. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to just go over a few housekeeping items. My name is Nicole Sticka, and I'm the Vice President of Energy Services with the Greater Cleveland Partnership, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We want to make sure today's presentation is extremely valuable for you, so we ask that you submit all questions by clicking on the question button in the control panel and typing your question. We welcome questions throughout, so please do submit your questions during today's presentation. And today's webinar is being recorded. I'm pleased to introduce to you today GCP's demand response and backup generator partners and our speakers today. First, you'll hear from our partner, Power Secure. Todd Jackson is the Eastern Utilities Vice President, and he is with Power Secure. He's going to be discussing how to right size your generator for your unique needs. Second, you'll hear from our demand response partner, C Power. Kellen Bolatino is the account executive for PJM and CSP, and C Power has been a longtime partner with us and is a market leader in curtailing power and incentives. Today, we'll discuss how to earn incentives by curtailing power by having the right type of backup generator in place during peak demand and outages. You'll learn how to optimize interior and exterior lighting and controls, HVAC and mechanical, and electrical systems, and reductions to KWH and your carbon footprint with the right size generator for your unique needs. And most importantly, how to benefit from participation in a demand response program. So you see how these two really dovetail together. You'll then also learn about participation in PJM's Capacity Performance Demand Response Program. Yes, that sounds like a lot, uh, but it's a simple way of earning your company money for being available year round to use less energy when the grid is stressed. C Power can help your organization in the winter and summer maximize its savings and in earning potential while participating in this lucrative demand response program on your terms. Lastly, you'll find out how to qualify, the costs, what is required from your facility, and most importantly, how to provide resiliency and re reliability with cash back. So let's get started. Todd is going to share with us more about C Power, how companies are taking advantage of putting in systems that are right for their building to ensure reliability, resiliency, and that redundancy. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Todd to get us started. Thank you, Nicole. Um, just to check right quick, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you again. Um, very glad to be here today, and I appreciate everybody spending some time with us uh, this afternoon. Thank you. So Nicole asked me to speak about uh, resilient solutions. So I'm, uh, she explained, I'm from Power Secure, and hopefully uh, some or all of y'all have uh, heard of Power Secure. So Power Secure is uh, headquartered in Durham, North Carolina, and we do distributed infrastructure, distributed energy resource projects across the United States to provide customers resiliency and the ability to participate in the energy markets that uh, Kellen is gonna be speaking about a little bit later in this presentation. So Nicole asked me to speak about uh, resiliency. So resiliency, very easy. How quick can you restore power uh, once there's a power outage? So how long of a power outage can your business take? So Power Secure, um, one of the leaders in microgrid solutions. Most of our solutions are what we call behind the customer meter. So installed on the customer side of the utility meter, we do serve quite a few utilities across the country that we will connect at the substation to be able to provide individual feeder circuits off of that substation resilient solutions as well. So the solution as defined by several people and several different entities in the marketplace uh, basic microgrids and advanced microgrid so basic microgrid would be one of these energy devices installed behind the meter behind the customer meter to be able to have a facility 
run islanded or paralleled with the utility. Islanded for situations when there is power outage so that your facility will still have the power it needs for you to conduct your operations are islanded um, for some of the programs that Kellen's going to talk about. Um, demand response programs uh, without intrusion to your business. Advanced microgrid is two or more of these devices. Same, still the same mode of operation to where you can run islanded or parallel with the advanced microgrid running parallel with the grid, it opens more of a energy market play for the use of your distributed energy device. Uh, for example, if you have solar and you're in a utility area service territory to where there's time of use rates, the solar can be run in parallel with utility power so that you can uh, have cost savings by supplying your own power during those high time of use rates. Still um, very little intrusion or little to no intrusion to your business to be able to operate in the island or in the parallel mode. Um, one important piece uh, we find is 24 seven monitoring of the microgrid so that we ensure that the microgrid assets, the power, is in place for when either the grid goes dark um, or when uh, there's a called event that you may be enrolled in through C power for you to be able to monetize the energy devices. So at Power Secure, we're a completely integrated business. Um, we don't rely on other manufacturers except for some small um, piece parts that go into our solutions. So if you look at the ability for one company to go from solution development all the way through operations and analytics of the performance of the assets, uh, we're probably one of three companies across, that can do this across the country. We have on our staff um, a deal structuring team that will look at the economic value of distributed energy in the market. We have our own design team that turns the solution design into actionable construction drawings that are manufactured in our Durham, North Carolina facility. We have our own in-house construction commissioning, uh, monitoring, we spoke just briefly about uh, service maintenance, uh, operations, meaning control and dispatch, and then uh, advanced analytics so that we can watch the performance of the solutions that we put out there and make real-time improvements to the products that we manufacture ourselves. So the power of the vertical or uh, in-house, total in-house integration is that all of these 11 chevrons report to one CEO. So there's um, complete uh, accountability by each and every part to one leader of our business and to our customer without us having to go external to get goods and services to be able to provide the solutions that we put in place for you. So we think that the 360 degree integration offers us um, a good bit, <clears throat> excuse me, a good bit of latitude of being able to control the cost and quality as well as the ongoing operation of our solution to make sure that everything runs seamlessly from the day that we design the solution to it's installed, commissioned, and up and operational. There's two main parts of the power secure business, uh, distributed infrastructure, which is our distributed energy products part of the business, and then energy efficiency. As additional market revenue or market uh, energy market participation, 
the energy efficiency aspect is able to address reduce reducing your carbon footprint because the greenest electron out there is one that's not used so we work very hard at energy efficiency on our projects to not only offer a source of um, funding for the project if you will because energy efficiency is also a reduction of your energy expense um, but addressing the sustainability or the reduction in carbon footprint goals that the majority of our customers have we believe that doing these projects at the same time really optimizes the solution for the customer because if you were to do the distributed energy resource project first and then circle back around to do the energy efficiency you've most likely likely bought more distributed energy than you require because if you when you do the energy efficiency you're reducing your peak demand on the grid so the ability for one company to address an energy efficiency product or excuse me project and a distributed infrastructure product project we believe is very beneficial to our customer base and makes us unique in the marketplace so if you combine um, distributed energy and energy efficiency and the ability to run parallel or excuse me islanded from the grid you're going to hit the three main points that the majority of our potential customer base and, and customer base are most interested in so so first uh, resiliency so the ability to their business recover very quickly from a power outage return on investment in the form of being able to do more than just offset lost capacity or lost profitability with a resiliency solution so using the distributed energy project to also be able to participate in energy markets offers an accelerated payback of that capital investment to put the resiliency solution in and then with the majority of our projects using tier four final diesel which meets all of the epa certifications to be able to operate um, not only as emergency backup but as economic resource for the facility with our energy efficiency uh, solutions epa certified natural gas solutions and energy storage plus renewables we're able to address the reduction in carbon footprint as well as providing what most of our customers are really after which is resiliency from grid outages so talk through a couple of case studies here this is um this is wellspan hospital in york pennsylvania uh, they were looking for a resiliency solution their um, architect our engineer of record um, came to us and asked us to tender a proposal for offering resiliency. But after looking at the overall needs of Wellspan, we were able to convince them to go with our power block tier four final diesel solution because they're able to participate in uh, PJM programs that, uh, that Kellen will speak about here in a minute. Uh, being controlled and dispatched via our 24-7 monitoring. Uh, parallel switchgear, closed transfer, so that when the economic event is called, we're able to get the generators online, ability to accept the load without seeing a flicker of a light inside the wellspan hospital um, because of past power outages we actually installed um, fuel tanks that will allow them to run for 48 hours at a time without having to uh, to refuel the tier four final diesel generation so hospital health care is one of our major customer classes across the country this is an industrial facility in Greenville, North Carolina. 
same basic concept in uh, this part of the country. There is a coincident peak rate that the utility offers that the 7.2 megawatts worth of generation will run that facility during the utility called event. Again, parallel switchgear allowing the facility to not see any disruption or blink of power in their business, all controlled by our um, monitoring control and dispatch center that's there in North Carolina as well. The industrial facility um, growing part of our business based on storms in recent years, uh, especially coastal storms. Um, industrial facilities were not a big user of uh, backup generation, um, but here recently because of the increasing storm problem in the United States, we see quite a few industrial facilities coming to us. Uh, one of the other issues that we saw for with most industrial facilities is power quality issues. So continuous process with a power quality issue may make some of their continuous process equipment uh, drop offline. So we can incorporate, um, not in this situation, but we also can incorporate stored energy as a UPS to be able to um, ride through any voltage or frequency issues that may cause a manufacturing facility to go offline. This is a growing part of our business as well, which is the community microgrid or neighborhood microgrid. We've done three of these installations now. Uh, most of them are for most of the projects that we're looking at. All three of the ones that we've put in place are for new uh, communities going into place. But the value proposition for this neighborhood is there is uh, energy efficiency programs that the individual homeowners can sign up for that thermostat control or water heater control. So through the uh, dispatch, we can dispatch water heater and thermostat control for energy savings. There's solar in place at all three of the neighborhoods we've done in the vast majority of the ones that we're looking at now. Uh, mainly for time of use rate or net metering. There's battery storage in place to allow the solar to shift to get all the advantage of the solar production during those time of use rates, even if the sun isn't shining. And then the tier four final diesel uh, is in place for long-term power outages. The advantage that a lot of utilities are coming to us with for the community, the connected community, um, is instead of having small generators at each house, rooftop solar, maybe a battery wall that the utility can't integrate into their resource plan very easily, they're able to offer the homeowners better incentives for the whole neighborhood participating in the different programs versus individual homes. Most of the developers are um, adding this to the homeowner association dues, and you're having whole communities that are not experiencing power outages during the, uh, during the recent storms that we've had over the last few years. As the world changes due to the pandemic with more people working at home, we have uh, quite a few more homeowner associations, develop, developers, and utilities coming to us um, for the resiliency aspect of the community microgrid, for the fact that most people are working from home these days and uh, probably in the near future, a lot of businesses will not bring their employees back to a central office and work from home, continue to work from home. So to, uh, to recap just a little bit, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Kellen, is advanced microgrids are basic microgrids at the facility behind the customer meter. These are the majority of the customer types. 
that we serve across the country today with the value proposition of being able to accomplish the design business case analysis, manufacturing, installation, commissioning, service, monitoring, all under one, um, one business is um, really distinct advantage and makes us unique in the, in the industry. Plus the ability to do distributed energy resource projects and energy efficiency projects at the same time. Um, we believe that makes us extremely unique in the industry. Some quick stats um, to date, numbers probably slightly higher uh, now, but um, basically 1,800 distinct customer sites, customers across the country, um, leader with the most advanced microgrid sites and the most basic microgrid sites of all of our competitors. Uh, basic microgrids, we have about 85% of the installed base today. Uh, accounts for around two gigawatts worth of power that is controlled on and off the grid by our microgrid controls and being able to use our distributed energy put in place. Uh, our service organization, uh, largest independent service organization across the country, we're maintaining um, 19,000 plus different energy sites um, across the country. So thanks for your time today and uh, questions or Nicole, we can uh, move on to live to go. Great, thanks Todd. Um, no questions at this time, but uh, it should any other questions come in in the meantime, uh, we'll certainly circle back to those. Next up, we're gonna hear from Kellen, uh, who is with C Power, and he's gonna share with us more about the Capacity Performance Demand Response Program how having a tier four generator can um, help generate money for your company by using less energy when the grid is stressed. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it back uh, over and Kellen will share with us more. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, just to confirm, can you see my screen okay? Yes, you are good to go. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, thanks again. And uh, yeah, Todd, thanks, thanks for uh, the, the segue into the demand response programs and, and utilization of DER assets and, and generation assets uh, for these programs and uncovering incentives uh, that are that are out there right now for, for all the people on the call and, and in the PJM markets specifically uh, that they can capture this year and, and for future years to come. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today uh, is a little bit about Sea Power, our background, and where folks may have heard our name before uh, in the past, uh, and then a little bit about the demand response program, uh, and then how they can capture these incentives uh, in this year, 2021, and future years, uh, and then the timeline uh, to do so. We're, we're kind of running up to the, the deadline for, for this year as well, about six or seven weeks left. So CPower is actually the culmination of uh, three companies' demand response groups coming together uh, between 2014 to 2016. Probably some names that folks uh, are familiar with up here, uh, Constellation Energy, Exelon, uh, Johnson Controls, uh, and Converge. I'm a legacy Converge employee from 2008, uh, starting in the demand response arena. Uh, our group, Enterwise uh, Global Technologies, was partnered with uh, Constellation Energy's demand response group uh, that formed C Power back in 2014. Uh, then Johnson Controls demand response group uh, spun off and joined C Power in 2016. Uh, and so with that, we became the largest demand response provider in the United States, uh, managing, I want to say close to 12,000 sites, uh, a couple thousand megawatts of power across the United States, with a significant portion of our uh, focus in the, the PJM market or the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland market, which the state of Ohio is a part of. Uh, and so with that, we only work within these demand response programs. We are not a retail energy provider. We're not uh, working on solar projects or lighting projects or other energy efficiency work. We are just working within these energy curtailment and capacity incentives uh, within the market. So something a little bit different uh, that we're going to be talking about today with energy savings is we're only talking about KW or the capacity associated with your site. We won't be talking about KWH. Uh, and with that, we have two programs. One is the demand response program uh, and one is the energy efficiency program. 
uh, within the PJM market that I might be able to get to if time allows uh, today, but both are really around the capacity energy saved either through a direct curtailment or through a permanent uh, energy project, uh, lighting, variable frequency drive, whatever it may be, that the site is completed uh, in the past year or two. So within these sites and the folks on the call within the state of Ohio, uh, Bill 6 has reduced uh, any utility rebates that are on the table. And so now CPOWER and the GCP uh, are the only folks that can actually offer uh, energy incentives for a lighting project or a prescriptive measure or even new construction uh, that might be going on at your facilities. So if there's time, we maybe will hit on this, but today we're just going to be talking a bit about uh, the demand response programs. So within and what is PJM? Uh, PJM is the, the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland grid, uh, which actually monitors and manages the capacity or the KW market uh, across its 14 member states uh, and 20 utility uh, districts uh, or zones. And so with that, they have the, the base capacity program, which is really an emergency response. Sites are put on call in case PJM needs capacity uh, assistance in certain utility zones, such as First Energy, um, AEP, uh, Duquesne, whatever uh, utility zone it might be that might be teetering towards a potential outage uh, or emergency, they would call a capacity event. And for being on call, you're actually compensated for being in the program. Uh, outside of any emergency events, there is a one test event hour that is called by C Power um, as the provider. Uh, and then within that, you're just on call. You're, you're in the market. You're not being notified or tested on a monthly or quarterly basis. Uh, you're not trying to you know, look for events. Uh, the events are just part of your zone uh, that are happening. And this is completely separate from any utility program that your site might be involved with. So you can participate in both in most instances. Uh, this is really a grid-related program. Uh, within CPower's portfolio and PJM, we have other programs that are available. Um, ancillary or synchronous reserve, uh, economic demand response, uh, and then the energy efficiency programs, which I talked about. Uh, the two programs, ancillary or, or sync reserve and economic, really come into play when you have those fast responding curtailment assets, such as what Todd was talking about within Power Secure, uh, that you can respond within a five to 10 minute signal where you have a, a dedicated control system in place for that generation uh, or SCADA system in place for curtailment um, of your assets. So very different uh, than just the base demand response program of being on call with an hour or two hour advance notice um, or for a test event where you might get two weeks advance notice. This is really for sites that have the sophisticated offerings and capabilities to curtail within a short window uh, and is really kind of the second tier uh, or third tier of demand response. I use a, a crawl, walk, run a scenario that if you haven't participated before, it's always best to sign up for demand response and see how your facility reacts to it. Uh, and then you can move into you know, the second tier of economic or sync reserve uh, participation where you may be called on a lot more and you have to respond in a little bit faster fashion. Uh, so with that, those are more programs that are out there and more savings to be captured uh, within the PJM market. Uh, but the base and the, the easiest one to participate in would be the capacity program with just a one hour test event participation. So just to give a, a view of what a demand response program might look like, uh, maybe for your site or, or a similar site, this is actually a facility that participated within CPower's test event last year, June 25th. Uh, and as you can see, I think this is a, a commercial facility uh, that utilized uh, their actual curtailment strategy and not an on-site generator for their participation. So what the site actually did was had its normal uh, you know, morning of 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. low usage, no, no one's in the building, nothing's running. Uh, they knew that the test event was going to occur about two weeks in advance uh, with two days prior notification, two hours prior uh, and day ahead. And what they did was they actually started to pre-cool the facility uh, and ramp up their AC uh, usage and some of their other components within the building uh, that they knew they would need on this day just so that they didn't have any calls or, or issues throughout. They ramped up till about 11 o'clock and two hours uh, or three hours before the actual test event, they started to step down their usage uh, and get down below their commitment level, which is what we call a firm service level. Uh, and what they're doing there is they're getting down to the compliance measures necessary to meet 100% compliance and full capture of their capacity incentive. 
they held that measure for an hour and then ramped up their usage uh, within that time frame. Now, what you'll see on the, here with this example is that there's a seasonal peak line um, also associated with the site uh, and then the firm service line. This is not an all or nothing participation program. You don't need to reach 100% or 110% uh, to receive that full incentive. Anytime that your sites are below your seasonal peak, whether it's the summer or the winter peak, uh, and during a test event or an emergency events called, you're showing compliance in that time frame. So even if you're at 50, 60, or 70% of your curtailment amount uh, required, you're still going to be receiving an incentive back. So any curtailment put into the market is better uh, than no curtailment at all. You'll receive something for your participation. And that's a great thing about the program and, and the participation in it for the test event um, is that you're able to really work out you know, the first year kinks and see where you can really dial in the facility into if you don't have on-site generation um, through curtailment strategies uh, and discussions with C Power. If you have the on-site generation, uh, either through Power Secure, uh, you can actually really know how much you're going to put in each year, and it's a very simple push of a button participation. But as your site becomes more sophisticated and you understand your commitment levels, uh, you can actually dial in and find that that reduction amount each year, and it just becomes a residual payment on an annual basis of the capacity savings that you're bringing in. So it is a, a very lucrative program, uh, as we have customers that have been participating for 20 plus years uh, throughout the program's inception. Now, as I mentioned, it is a, a year-round program. Uh, so it's a summer participation and winter participation. We call those the, the seasonal peaks. Now, you're probably most used to your summer capacity level uh, or KW level associated with the utility release of your capacity tag uh, or summer peak level uh, that's released you know, every January or February by the utility and takes effect that following June 1st of the year. What PJM uh, really changed for everybody is that there is now a winter participation value as well. Uh, and this is in response to the polar vortex from 2012, uh, that they need to make sure that people can participate in the summer and the winter if there is such an anomaly uh, as that previous event. But the winter peak is actually set by sea power. We are given the parameter days and hours to find that number within the site's interval data, and we calculate that for registration. Uh, but really, within the program, there's only a summer test that's been established at this time. Any summer participation would be based on an actual, excuse me, any winter participation would be based on an actual winter event that would be called. Uh, so the summer test really becomes very important because for most zones, there's not been an emergency event since 2011 and for some since 2005. Uh, so right now, the test event has become the largest precursor to make sure that sites are capturing the most incentive for their participation. Uh, and with that, even if a site can't participate uh, or is unable to meet the test event or an emergency event, there's no out-of-pocket cost for anything discussed today, uh, and there's no penalties associated with the program uh, to the to your sites. CPower takes on um, all that penalty uh, performance risk. Uh, and, and market risk associated with under compliance or, or uh, not, pre or, excuse me, or not showing up for uh, the test or emergency event. I got fumbled there for a second. Uh, but with that, the sites actually would just receive a zero participation. So they would receive zero money back for that year. So your worst case scenario by not signing up is you wouldn't receive anything back for not being in the program. So it's better to sign up and try to participate uh, and get something back than just to sit on the sidelines uh, and not capture anything. A 50% participation or 70% still gets money back into your bottom line. Uh, with that, the program does have specific parameters around the number of events and event durations, but historically, in the events that have been called uh, in, the, in the time that it has occurred, uh, they've been about two hours to two and a half hours of total time. Uh, on average. So they're not very long events, even though it says that they can be up to 12 or 15 hours. That's really for extreme cases, uh, very similar to what we saw uh, down in ERCOT uh, or the Texas market this past year. Uh, the grid was not ready for those events. Uh, the ISO was not ready for those events. They weren't prepared for them. CPower's customers in that market did very well because we gave them advance notice that these events were going to be coming uh, and we helped them to prepare themselves, get additional backup generation, 
uh, work with additional fuel uh, needs that they may have to keep themselves up and running. So we were able to help them with that. But within the PJ market, it's very different. We're used to the cold. Uh, we're used to these cold snaps. Obviously, a polar vortex that occurred did catch a lot of folks off guard, but now we're prepared for it because we had never seen it before. But now we know that there is a need in the summer and the winter for these types of programs and participation, and we're better prepared for it in the long run. Uh, so there may be a few questions on that uh, coming up, but I'd be happy to elaborate further on, on those items as well. Within our program, uh, it is not required uh, within the, the state of Ohio if your site already has an interval meter, but if you did want to see your actual energy usage in near real, real time without waiting for utility data, we can put in um, our data loggers or asset management tools. If your sites are only have summary meters in place, you will need to add uh, these devices so that we can capture that utility interval data to show compliance to PJM. Uh, but if your sites already have it, it's not a requirement for program participation. It's a great tool if you have multiple sites and 10, 20, or 50 meters uh, on your facility's uh, campus. What it does is it actually aggregates that information together to a single source of information. It gives you real-time uh, energy use information either by the account, meter, or site name level, whatever it may be. It does have weather and pricing overlays. So you can actually see the real-time market price and day-ahead market price uh, within the area or zone, uh, and then manage your usage around that. Uh, additionally, exports of data and uh, usage overlays uh, of different sites. So if you have two sites that should be running uh, at a similar level based on their usage or in two different states, uh, you can actually take a look at that and see if any anomalies or any differences they might have. Uh, it's a very beneficial tool if you're gonna be utilizing that and are not getting your energy data uh, in real time now. Uh, and again, CPower is not, we're not a meter company. This is something that we offer uh, zero out of pocket cost uh, we take a small portion of your DR savings in the first year to cover the installation fee, which is about $1,000 uh, per meter. Uh, and again, one of our data loggers can capture 10 utility meters. So it's not a one-for-one -one situation. Uh, depending on the meter location, we can actually capture a lot of the data with just one of our devices. It can be a very powerful tool uh, for energy efficiency treasure hunts. Uh, and just understanding data use, me, energy usage uh, in near real time. So I just wanna make sure I haven't, not going over my time as well. Uh, so one thing uh, I do like to bring up within these discussions is uh, lost opportunity cost. So for sites that aren't participating in the DR program because you know they can't do it or they're, they're too busy or they don't have the capabilities to do so, uh, what we noticed last year with the, the pandemic that occurred is that a lot of sites had to shut down and they found ways to do that. Uh, and the program is really based around those types of anomalies and things that occur that you may not be expecting. Uh, and also, if the grid or the utility called you and said, hey, your, your area is gonna be shut down for an emergency, you know, what would your site do with two hours advance notice? Or what would they do with two weeks advance notice to help save that energy, uh, possibly save a product line, uh, equipment, whatever it may be, uh, to find those, those savings associated uh, with the operations, not just with the money on the table. So we are now looking at this and have, I've been, uh, as more of a, a savings of operations, uh, savings of product, uh, and uh, in addition, being paid for being a good energy participant. So there's twofold to it of preparing yourself and your facility for any potential outages or uh, issues that may occur uh, within the market, but also putting yourself in a good position that when that does happen, you're receiving advance notice and you're receiving an incentive for, for curtailing. Uh, so within the first energy market over the past five years, a site that was able to register a thousand KW uh, and curtail for the five hours of participation would have captured back around $156,000. Uh, now I do have an asterisk uh, in 2019-20 because there was uh, an emergency event that was called in the AEP market uh, out of nowhere in October. Uh, it was outside of program parameters, but I did want to put that in there that there was an event called uh, in AEP in, uh, in 2019. But for the most part, every other part of the zones in Ohio and in this ADSI market or first energy market uh, would receive $150,000 for one megawatt 
of participation in the program, which is substantial uh, for five hours worth of work. This year, 2021, uh, that same site last year that put in a megawatt of curtailment last year uh, only would have received $19,500. Well, this year, because of the increase in capacity prices, they're now going to be able to capture back $40,000. Now, this is not money that has changed. The utilities didn't change the prices. The capacity market adjusted and the capacity prices more than doubled from 2020 to 2021. So this is money that your sites are spending into the market right now. Come June 1st of 2021, you're going to see a big change in your, in your utility bill, which will cause these increases in your overall spending for your site. So if you've got a megawatt or 500 kW or 300 kW that you can curtail into the market um, as a single site or as an aggregate, that's money that you can capture back to save on your overall energy spend. Now bundling that within an energy efficiency project that may have been completed this past year or something coming up in the future, there's money on the table for you to capture. So I'm gonna pause there. Uh, Nicole, I can if you want me to, to go into the energy efficiency program, uh, or I can... Um, before, you, before you do, um, this is a question that came in for both of you that I think um, is most applicable in this spot, and that is, are battery prices coming down and getting cheaper, and are they um, eligible for demand response programs? Uh, sure, yeah, Todd, if you wanted to go with that on the battery cost, and I can talk about DR and... Program. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, I'll take the battery costs. Yes, battery costs are coming down uh, as more and more installations are going in place. The um, the dollars per kilowatt hour of a battery is on the decline. There, um, I mean, Kellen can talk about the value of the battery in DR. For coincident peak type rates, you're going to have to have at least a uh, four hour battery and the um i was trying to think of the other programs uh we see most useful for battery is the is the coincident peak program but uh kellen i'll let you you're the expert on the the value of the battery in the marketplace i'll let you talk about yeah. that i was gonna say yeah we have seen the cost of batteries come down and uh and to todd's point it, it really depends on the on the battery and making sure that it's it's set up correctly for the facility and to participate in these types of programs within PJM. So uh, there's coincident peaks. There's the the base demand response program, uh, which is the easiest one because it's you know, that hour test, and then uh, any actual emergency events, uh, the battery will be dispatched by PJM if it is connected to the grid. Uh, and the other program that comes up, uh, or two programs, would be synchronous reserve uh, and frequency regulation. Uh, so both of those programs are for fast responding assets. Uh, Sync Reserve can make you know, between twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars a megawatt. Uh, right now, those prices could change, uh, and frequency is right around ninety-five to a hundred thousand dollars a megawatt, uh, and that's annually. So that happens each year. Uh, and again, those prices are subject to change based on PJM uh, filings, changes, market conditions. Uh, there is. Thing on the table right now that in 2022 23, uh, PJM will start looking at faster responding assets such as batteries uh, for participation in programs and incentivizing them more. Uh, so that sync program uh, and frequency programs prices could increase in future years, but it's not known. We don't even know the capacity prices uh, for these next two or three years. Uh, we don't know where the prices for sync and frequency are going to come in uh, either, but. Those are the historic prices, is right around that $30,000 for sync and $100,000 for uh, frequency. And then bundle that with DR, you're looking at close to maybe you know $200,000 annually for a one megawatt battery. And so Kellen, we suggest that you don't try to tackle any of the sync or frequency without anything other than a battery. Um, so would you concur with that? We, we've seen customers that participate in, in both programs without batteries. Uh, so they utilize uh, just shutdown uh, mechanisms for, for sync. Uh, frequency obviously is very sophisticated. Um, you would need to have a very high-end uh, variable frequency drive and SCADA system to connect uh, to the frequency program. Uh, but for sync, uh, any assets can participate 
uh, in the sync program as long as they can curtail within an eight to 10 minute notification. Great. Another question that came in is how many microgrid systems are installed in Ohio and how many participating customers in Ohio for PJM? Um, I can pull, Nicole, I can pull our monitoring records and look uh, for Ohio, but um, right off the top of my head, it's in the tens, not in the hundreds um, okay. in Ohio. Right. Yeah, was the other part of that how many uh, DR how many, participants? It, yes, that is the question. Yeah, I'd say it's it's probably in in the low hundreds, maybe 200, uh, 300 or so. Who we've got a number of them. I don't. I'd rather be conservative than than blow up a, a number. But we've got a very strong mixture of customers from from school districts uh, and big box retailers um, all the way up to. Uh, large steel mills uh, so you know the 100 kws all the way up to the 90 megawatt curtailment levels um, across ohio but i would say in that you know 300 to 500 range uh, of customers right so and Nicole, i think it just goes to show that in the atsi region i mean it's it's very generous payments uh especially in this next year so for those that have completed projects kellen i know you're going to be getting into uh more around the energy efficiency resources next mm -hmm. um and and that kind of dovetails into my next question and that is how does a business budget for a backup generator if they don't have one in place now or if they've got just an antique system in place that's not a tier four that qualifies for demand response how do they upgrade it and benefit from participation in uh, the EE resource program through C Power, uh, and then also demand response. So, kind of a, a tri-part question there. So, so good question. Let's start with the antique uh, generator first. There can be uh, what's called a niche app upgrade uh, to that generator that will bring it to the EPA certifications at the time that will allow it to participate in demand response programs that C Power can enroll uh, the customer into demand, demand response programs or any basically any of the programs that Kellen talked about um, once we upgrade the generator. Um, obviously, if it's a, a relic of an antique, um, you can replace the generator. So we contract with customers uh, one of three ways. One is capital turnkey project. So we will either install or um, or replace a uh, existing generator. We will go to C Power, get Kellen to tell us what the market value will of the the uh, use of the generator into one of the PJM programs and we'll give you a 20-year performa style statement that says this dollar spent on a generator comes back as this amount of money that will help offset the cost the capital turnkey cost of the project over three four years uh typically to uh, to pay back the capital dollars that was that that middle block when i talked about resiliency and return on investment by putting a uh, tier four final or either an EPA certified gener generator in place lets you have access to these energy markets. The, the second is a, uh, is a capital lease. Uh, so no capital out of the customer's pocket up front and Power Secure will uh, fund a capital lease over a 10 or 15 year period to where the annual payment will be just the capital lease value of the project that will be offset by the earnings in the energy market. And at some of the prices that Kellen's been talking about, that's what we call low or no cost way to get a, uh, a generation solution put in place that allows you to participate in the market. With the 30 year life of a generator, if you have a 15 year capital lease on the other end, of the capital lease, the equipment will uh, transfer to you at a nominal amount. It's usually a dollar, and so then for the next 15 years, you're going to be able to uh, to to make 
money off of uh, putting that generator in place. There's also um, what we call resiliency as a service, which there's no contemplation by the customer of ever owning the distributed energy asset. So we own, operate, and maintain for the life of the energy asset, which is offset by the uh, the amount of money that can be generated from the uh, from the energy market. Talon, did you have anything to add to that? If not, we can um, proceed with talking about the energy efficiency resources. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, unless it's a, a cogen, a, a true, or excuse me, a true combined heat and power uh, update, that, that's when you can get the energy efficiency incentives associated with with a project. Uh, with that, I think as, as Todd mentioned, you know, we can update and retrofit uh, a gen if it's something that it's that old that it may not be able to be retrofitted. You know, we can help with that aspect for it to get up to speed. Uh, but if it's going to be a new uh, piece, you're going to want to talk with with Power Secure, and then they'll they'll loop us in on the the value associated with it and getting it fully connected. Uh, within our programs uh, and then utilizing you know their command system and, and controls it can participate in, in all these programs and, and cut down on that overall spend uh, initially but yes yeah, c-power does you know generator reviews and we usually give uh, high level analyses for retrofits uh, as well for sites that they don't need to do a complete uh, new project but if they just want to update the existing piece that they have uh, we can do that retrofit as well yeah. Hey, great. Let's um, take the last uh, five minutes or so, Kellen, and talk about the energy efficiency resources through C Power. Okay, I'll do one better. I'll, I'll try to get it under two in case there's any questions uh, as well. So, um, as mentioned, within the state of Ohio, House Bill 6, uh, if you're not familiar, came through and all the utilities in Ohio stopped uh, providing rebate incentives so that would be you know, prescriptive measures non-prescriptive measures uh, associated with their utility program and left uh, a lot of their, their rate paying customers um, out in the cold for any efficiency projects that they had in place or that they've been moving forward with the great thing that we're seeing is that uh, folks are not stopping their projects because the rebates um, aren't available they're continuing because the these rebates and these excuse me these efficiency projects uh, make great financial sense and are creating strong energy savings for these facilities. What CPower uh, and the GCP have been working uh, towards is getting the, the message out uh, to these end-use customers, either through partnerships uh, of the installers or engineering firms or directly to uh, end-use customers, that there are rebates on the table. PJM does offer capacity incentives for energy efficiency projects completed in the last two years. So even though the, there may have been a utility rebate on the table uh, back in 2019, 2020, there are still incentives that are out there from PJM. And any projects that are being completed right now uh, into June of 2021, there's definite incentives that are able to be captured uh, by C Power and the GCP. Uh, it's really straightforward, similar to uh, an energy efficiency rebate program from the utility. We just need some information on the project. You know, it's what was uh, there before uh, and what's currently being installed. You know, the, the simple way to look at it is a lighting project line by line. You know, there were T8s in the building and now we're putting in LEDs. The building runs, uh, you know, nine to five Monday through Friday. So about 4,500 hours throughout the year. Uh, with that, it created this much in KW savings. And we capture that KW savings and present that to PJM and they're actually able to put a dollar amount to it. Um, in the first energy market, it's roughly around 60 to $80 uh, per KW uh, that, are, that are captured back. Now, this could be for lighting projects, HVAC updates, process or operational improvements, uh, green or LED building certifications, variable frequency drives, new construction, uh, which is a big thing, or expansions, uh, or any major renovations that happened uh, at a facility. So a couple of things that, that I will highlight on uh, is that process improvements uh, is one that is usually not thought of because it's a non-prescriptive measure that normal utilities don't offer incentives for. But if you have an old operation line or production or manufacturing line and you take out that line and put in something that's more efficient, 
uh, that actually creates KW savings. Uh, so we can actually take that project and either how much the production line has improved on efficiency uh, or the old equipment that was taken out uh, and the new equipment put in the, the differential to, to find KW savings associated with it. Um, and that's the same thing with new construction. So you may think that new construction isn't part of an efficiency endeavor, but we can actually take what the site could have utilized for a non-efficient uh, build and what they've done to be more efficient uh, within their new construction or this new building that's going up. So we're able to be very uh, nimble within our findings and we try to look at different projects in different ways. Uh, we've worked with all different types of facilities, whether it's a, a large automotive manufacturer uh, or a school district uh, that's just down the street and they, they've done a simple lighting project to uh, you know, a large manufacturing facility that's taken out two megawatts of production lines uh, and put in more efficient equipment. So it's a straightforward program. It really comes down to the transference of data. Uh, it starts with the information that your sites have. Uh, if you can share the project scope, uh, line by line information, uh, or any details uh, around the project savings on the energy side, uh, we can usually find the KW associated with it. So I'll, I'll leave it there. We've got four minutes or three minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, uh, Kellen, for that overview. And he's right, I mean, GCP has assisted hundreds of businesses at this point with capturing these rebates uh, for their past projects that they've completed. Andrew Smizer on the Greater Cleveland Partnership team works intimately with those projects. So uh, we still have a little bit of time uh, with being able to submit those uh, for this next uh, cycle. So please do get those in if you've completed any projects that did not already receive a rebate from uh, First Energy or the utility. We don't have any um, additional questions at this time. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to just put out two plugs uh, on upcoming webinars. One is April 7th, and that's on which air sanitization is right for your building. Obviously, there's various technologies and misconceptions uh, given the pandemic and what's right for your building. So we're gonna dispel those myths and talk through the various solutions uh, to making your building more healthy and safe uh, for anybody that is within it. And then also on April 17th, we're gonna be talking about PACE financing and the market updates. We've had some great projects in Northeast Ohio utilize this. And today, as we talk about what energy efficiency projects you're doing and maximizing resources, PACE financing is a great way to uh, leverage an alternative financing solution to achieve your energy efficiency projects and use the energy efficiency resource through C Power uh, to capture a cash rebate back on that. So I'm not seeing any further questions uh, at this time. And so Today, you heard about why it's important to incorporate an integrated and more comprehensive energy management approach. Uh, I'm sure you don't want to disrupt any of your operations or your tenants, and having backup and resiliency is, is critically important to ensure that you have also the best power quality. Uh, I think as, as time goes on, we're gonna see that we don't necessarily always wanna rely on the grid, especially if and when it becomes stressed. So don't lose out on productivity when the grid goes out for an unknown period of time, especially with our manufacturers who can't necessarily afford that downtime. So of course, being able to get paid to test your generator and to have that in place during peak times should be a no brainer. And it's really not too good to be true since those dollars are real and can benefit your bottom line. So with that, I would like to thank both Todd and Kellen for joining us today. Uh, and thank you all of you for joining us as well. With that, uh, we will conclude today's webinar. Thank you all for attending and have a great day. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you.